Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Good morning, depending on where you're listening to us. Welcome and thank you for joining us for CFP Board's Certificate Connection webinar. I'm Kevin Keller, CFP Board CEO, joining you live from Washington, D.C. We're about two blocks from the White House here at CFP Board headquarters, and uh, there are still some protests going on outside, and if you hear a little noise, uh, you'll know what that is. During today's webinar, we have updates from this week's Board of Directors meeting. We'll review the process for refreshing CFP Board's strategic priorities. We'll learn about our initiatives to advance diversity and inclusion and get an update on our latest practice analysis study. After those updates, we'll turn to answering your questions, always the fun part of the webinar. So let me cover a few housekeeping topics before we get started. If you run into issues with your audio, or if it seems like the slides are out of sync, you should refresh your webinar console. Just press F5 for those of you for F5, or for those of you on a Mac, hit Command R. There is a Q&A function on your screen that you can use to submit questions to us at any time during the program. We'll address as many questions as possible during the Q&A session at the end of the program. And if we don't get to your specific question today during the broadcast, CFP Board will follow up to provide you with an answer. Joining us today are two distinguished CFP professionals. Jack Brode is the 2020 Chair of the Board of Directors, and Doug King is the 2020 Chair-Elect. Doug will be Chair of the Board in 2021. Thank you all for joining us today. And Jack, why don't we start off with you with an update from the Board meeting. Thank you, Kevin. I would love to provide that. I'll start off by saying we've had a very productive couple days, um, an excellent board meeting that wraps up what has been a very busy year. Uh, no surprise, this was our second regular meeting that was held virtually due to the pandemic, but like everybody else, we're learning how to navigate um, our responsibilities in this virtual world. It's customary at our November meeting each year that uh, we conclude the nominating process for new board members with the election of, of new directors. We will be announcing the new members this coming Monday, so you can look out for that. All of the incoming board members are impressive, and the board looks forward to working with these great new additions to the team, which will begin in January. In addition, this week, we also reviewed the work that's being done to strengthen CFP Board's governance and enterprise risk management processes. So let's, let's talk about both of those a little bit. <clears throat> First off, with respect to governance, you see here just a few of the governance updates we announced in September. We made some important changes to the board's composition and its approach to recruiting new members. Um, one of the things that we were trying to improve was the overall continuity of the board, given that it's a perpetual board. So the term for board directors um, is changing from what was a single four-year term to the possibility of two three-year terms. Um, there's an option there for the second three-year term, but we predict that many directors will now um, be able to provide six years of volunteer service to CFP board. Our bylaws require a majority of board members to hold CFP certification, and at a minimum, at least two board members be classified in the strict definition that we use as a public member. Today, our board has uh, 16 members, 10 of whom are CFP professionals, and four of whom meet that strict designation, that strict definition as public members. In the past, our call for nominations tended to focus a lot on these two categories. 
CFP classification public member defin definition. That will still continue to apply. However, when we issue the next call for nominations, you'll see that our recruiting priorities will, will first primarily focus squarely on the professional skills, experience, and knowledge <clears throat> that we believe are needed on the board. These and the many other governance updates and reforms that have been implemented support CFP board's ongoing evolution as the professional body for personal financial planners. This year, CFP board engaged a leading enterprise risk management consultant to help us review our current approach to enterprise risk management and recommend improvements going forward. <clears throat> they helped us benchmark our current program against those at peer organizations. They're conducting an enterprise risk assessment uh, to help us identify and assess the risks that face the CFP board. Many of you work for mid to larger size organizations, so you understand the complexities of today's world and, and the need to have a comprehensive enterprise risk program. After the risk identification process, the risk will be assessed and validated by CFP board's executive staff to determine which risks should be prioritized over the next year. This is obviously an important activity that will help the organization establish stronger processes for managing and monitoring risks. At our meeting this week, additionally, the board also dedicated a full day to focus on the strategic refresh process, which is geared towards updating CFP boards strategic priorities. So why don't, Doug, I turn that over to you and you can share where we're at in that process. Thank you, Jack, I'd be happy to do that. The CFP Board's current strategic plan launched in November of 2017 and it's anticipated to take us through the end of 2021. You see here on this slide, we call our 4A plan and this is focused on strategic priorities of awareness, access, accountability, and authority. And while we still have a year and several months left under this plan, the Board of Directors has been dedicating a significant amount of time as we prepare, prepare a refresh strategy to carry us beyond 2021. Here you see a high-level roadmap we've established for the strategy refresh process. The outcome of this process will be a new strategic plan for the CFP board, which we expect to adopt at the board's meeting in July of 2021. And because the CFP board has an important role in the advancement of the entire profession, we're providing, we're approaching the process with a broad professional wide perspective before we narrow down to the areas where the CFP board can make, make the most impact. Many of you know that last December, brought the 50th anniversary of a pivotal meeting. That is considered the birth of financial planning profession. We took that occasion to convene a forum of nearly 100 leaders from across the financial advice ecosystem to discuss the future of advice, of financial advice. The forum outlined the beginnings of a shared picture of future success, including key factors that must be addressed in order to accelerate the development of a profession that is recognized and sought after. We released a summary of that meeting in a publication titled The Future of Financial Planning Profession, which you can find on the CFP Board's website. And since that December 2019 meeting, the CFP Board of Directors has continued the discussion. We've dedicated a substantial amount of time this year to discuss the outcomes of this forum and to refine some key elements discussed at the forum. On this slide, you'll see 17 elements that we landed on under the categories of consumer, public, professional practitioner, and professional workforce. For each element, we spent time outlining where we think currently, where we currently are, what opportunities and barriers exist, and what research and findings relate to the element, and most importantly, what we want to see in the future. We developed concise future desired state statements for each and I'd like to share those with you today. Here's the desired future statement for key elements of the consumer public category. 
The first is consumer access to financial planners. Consumers from all income brackets should have access to competent, ethical, relevant, and affordable financial planning services. The next is public awareness. Consumers value financial planning and recognize and trust CFP professionals as competent and ethical. The third is empirical evidence. Empirical evidence demonstrates that consumers who access holistic financial planning have more successful financial life outcomes than those who did not access those services. The next is regulation. A regulatory body for financial planners works in the public interest by setting and enforcing the standards of competency and ethics, including a financial duty, uh, excuse me, a fiduciary duty required of all who use the title financial planner. The fifth is financial literacy. Financial planners improve the financial well-being of consumers, particularly those in underserved communities, by actively supporting programs aimed at improving financial literacy and capability. The next is service commitment, in this case meaning pro bono. Pro bono services play a crucial role in the financial planning delivery framework, supporting people in crisis or need as fulfillment of the public service commitment. And the seventh is public interest advocacy. The public interest is effectively represented on policy matters related to financial planning and advice. On this slide, you'll see the desired future state statements for the key elements in the financial, excuse me, the professional practitioner category. The first is competency standards. The public is confident that CFP professionals have the knowledge, skills, and abilities to provide financial planning in accordance with a fiduciary duty. The next is ethical standards. High ethical standards, including a fiduciary duty, apply to all financial planners. Third is standards enforcement. The CFP board's enforcement of ethical standards merits public trust while being fair to CFP certificates. The next is body of knowledge. Consumers benefit from an accessible and evolving financial planning body of knowledge supported by an active academic community delivering research and validated by practice. And the fifth is practitioner community. A practitioner community exists that is recognized and, and respected as the credible, cred, credible voice and the authoritative source on financial planning. And here are the desired future statements for the key elements in the professional workforce category. The first is attractive career choice. Students across all, level, all levels and demographics understand financial planning is a rewarding and fulfilling career choice. The next is, res is respected baccalaureate programs. The majority of new financial planners enter the profession with a baccalaureate degree or higher in financial planning. The third is established career path. The profession clearly defined and established career paths attract and retain its next generation. The next is diverse workforce. The profession's workforce reflects the U.S. population. And the fifth is talent pipeline. The, talent, the pipeline of talent meets the expanding consumer demand for financial planning and replaces an aging workforce. So we recently shared our thinking about these elements during a roundtable meeting with leaders across financial services industry. And we also sought input, input from our CFP professionals through a survey to help us see which areas of our CFP professionals think are the most important for the CFP board's work and where you think as, CF, as the CFP board can make the most impact. We're taking these insights from that discussions and the survey to refine the future desired state statements. And through this process, we're updating the framework for the CFP board's work over the next few years and we're addressing issues that impact the profession. Doug, thank you very much. Uh, the elements of a diverse workforce, that is the profession's workforce reflects the U.S. population, is something that CFP Board has already begun to work toward within the CFP profession. Jack, why don't you say a little bit more about that? Sure thing. As I think most of our listeners know, it was back in 2015 that CFP Board founded the Center for Financial Planning with its mission to create a more diverse and sustainable financial planning profession 
so that every American has access to competent and ethical financial planning advice. Um, at, at its very core, advancing diversity and inclusion is central to the center's mission. Before I get into some of the center's diversity initiatives, I want to acknowledge the continuing energy we're seeing in the movement to address the effects of racial injustice and applaud all CFP professionals of color and every CFP professional who has been and will continue to be on the forefront of this fight for equity and justice. CFP board and the financial planning profession are collectively accountable for making substantive change. So CFP board's work to advance diversity and inclusion in the profession actually began several years before we launched the Center for Financial Planning. Our women's initiative highlighted the underrepresentation of women in the profession. It included significant research projects exploring the reasons for that situation and identifying actionable solutions. After the center was established, we doubled down on our commitment to advancing diversity and inclusion by making that one of the three priorities of the center. And we expanded our focus to include racial and ethnic diversity. As we did with the women's initiative, we have taken a research-based approach. In fact, uh, back in 2017, the center commissioned a comprehensive research study to identify the barriers to racial and ethnic diversity in the profession. That research was shared in the center's 2018 thought paper titled Racial Diversity in Financial Planning, Where We Are, Where We Must Go. For example, research found that African Americans and Latinos lack awareness of financial planning and the CFP certification process. However, CFP professionals who are African American and Latino said that they were as highly satisfied in their careers as other CFP professionals, and they were actually more likely to recommend the profession. Perhaps most importantly, the paper provides concrete actions that can be taken to advance diversity and inclusion. CFP board and the center are facilitating some of these actions directly, such as offering opportunities to people of color pursuing CFP certification through our mentor program and our career center. Other actions are things you can do within your own firms, like advocating for and recommending people of color for advancement and opportunities. You know, many, many feel like we do at CFP board that advancing diversity and inclusion is just the right thing to do. But we also know from research that diversity is good for business. Last year, the center released a literature review titled Why Diversity Matters that makes the business case for diversity and inclusion. It compiles research studies demonstrating that greater diversity does in fact lead to stronger sales revenue, customer growth, and higher profit levels. It also outlines data-supported explanations for how diversity leads to stronger overall financial performance. Advocates of diversity inclusion can use these to encourage business leaders to act on the recommendations in the studies. These publications were introduced at the center's diversity summits. Which leads me to um, the next item. Our third diversity summit is coming up soon, and it will be held in a virtual format, offering each of you listening an opportunity to attend. On November 18th through 20th, this year's summit will bring together thought leaders in financial planning and beyond to focus on actionable and sustainable initiatives to advance diversity. Each day's programming will last three hours and will showcase best practices in organizational diversity and inclusion and hopefully inspire the industry even further to work together to make our vision of diversity a reality. The center will be releasing a new report with case studies of successful diversity and initiative practices within the financial services industry. There will be case study panels covering some of those successful diversity initiatives. 
and there will be an executive roundtable with leaders of firms in the financial planning, financial advice industry, who are very much committed to diversity and inclusion initiatives. Here on this slide, you'll see some of the excellent and impressive speakers we have confirmed for the program. There will be keynote presentations from Melody Hobson of Ariel Investments, Andy Sieg of Merrill Lynch Wealth Management, and Brian Lamb of J.P. Morgan Chase. And to wrap up the event, we are holding a virtual career fair on November 20th focused on opportunities for women and people of color. We truly hope you'll attend this important event on November 18th through the 20th. Registration is free, and it's a virtual event, so there's really no excuse not to attend. And if you are interested in making an impact now to help advance diversity and inclusion in the profession, there is at least one tangible way, among others, that you can help. You can help someone fulfill someone's dream of becoming a CFP professional by supporting scholarship programs, for example. Each of the great scholarship programs listed here are helping build the profession's talent pipeline while fostering diversity. And the feedback we've heard from scholarship recipients is really wonderful. Even a small bit of financial support can be life-changing. So if interested, you can learn more about our programs and you can make a financial gift to support the programs at cfp.net backslash support our scholarships. Jack, Gavin? thank you very much. Thank you very much. I um, have three topics that I'll try to cover quickly before we get to the Q&A portion. The first is the CFP exam. The most recent exam administration took place September 22nd through the 29th, and we had almost 1,400 individuals pass the exam with a 65% pass rate. It was the first exam to offer remote proctoring. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we postponed our July exam to September and later announced the availability of remote proctoring. We weren't sure what demand for this option would be like, and as it turns out, only 6% of the September exam candidates chose remote proctoring. Before we offered the option, I went through personally a, a check-in, and it's a very thorough experience. You have to have you have to have the camera all around. You can't have anything behind you. Bookcases. You have they are watching you uh, the entire time that uh, you're taking the exam, including where your eyes are focused. So um, while the exam content doesn't change. It's the exact same exam for those taking the remote option. Clearly, the experience can feel very different. Remote proctoring went, went smoothly for nearly everyone, but a handful of September exam candidates did have technology issues on their end. We've offered those individuals the option to retake the exam at no cost during the November window, which is actually going on now, we're in our third day, which will also have the remote option. And prior to the November exam, we'll provide additional recommendations to those remote testers to help mitigate technology issues. The CFP exam is an important part of CFP board's competency standards. CFP Board is in what I like to call the Financial Planning Competency Assurance Business. We assure the public that the individuals who are certified undergo a rigorous process before they're allowed to use the CFP marks. This process involves satisfying requirements for education, experience, examination, and ethics. This is consistent with our mission of certifying financial planners for the public's benefit. So CFP Board upholds not just the ethical standards of CFP certification, 
but competency standards as well. Our efforts in assuring a valid certification program are essential in maintaining our accreditation. CFP certification is accredited by the National Commission of Certifying Agencies, or NCCA. And NCCA accreditation is the only leading standard for professional certification programs. In fact, on the FINRA professional designation website, there are well over 200 certifications and designations, and only eight of them are accredited. This accreditation is essential for trust and legal defensibility of our certification. CFP certification was first accredited way back in 1995, and that was the first ever non-health-related NCCA accreditation in the U.S. In 2019, we undertook the renewal process and successfully passed the re-accreditation requirements. Our next accreditation review will be in five years or in 2024. Given our accreditation requirements, we are required to undertake regular reviews of the certification program and update the content through a job task analysis, which we call our practice analysis study. The findings of this major research project establish our principal knowledge topics and our job task domains, which make up the topics that are included in the educational content that those of you certified have already been through, the topics that are covered on the exam, and also the topics that are accepted for continuing education credit. This year, we're also developing a competency framework that will describe the attributes, aptitudes, and skills that financial planners need to succeed. As in past practice analysis studies, a major component was research with CFP professionals, and I want to thank everyone who participated in the surveys. This year, we also included research with firms that hire CFP professionals and clients who use CFP professionals to understand their expectations as well. Here you can see the outcomes of our previous practice analysis, our current principal topics, and the job task domains. We're still finalizing the outcomes of the 2020 practice analysis, so I don't have an updated list to share with you at this time, However, we will be releasing the report and the new domains and principal knowledge topics before the end of the year. As you can guess by looking at the current list, much of this is still relevant to the practice of financial planning. So we can, I think, expect that the new list will retain much of what you see here. But I do want to share with you, we will be adding a new domain that we are calling the psychology of financial planning. This will expand on some of the concepts that CFP Board has advanced through our client psychology book and the client psychology program that we currently offer with Wharton, as well as concepts related to the client and planner attitudes, values, biases, and behavioral finance, which are included in the current topic list. This, uh, as an important new domain with room for development in both theory and practice, and we look forward to helping build that out. The practice analysis is an essential part of CFP Board's work to maintain and enhance the relevance of CFP certification and again, we look forward to sharing with you the updated topics and domains before the end of the year. Lastly, I want to share with you a quick update on our consumer website, letsmakeaplan.org, or as we refer to it at CFP Board, LMAP, Let's Make a Plan. 
This website was launched in 2011 as part of our public awareness campaign. We currently spend about $12 million a year on the public awareness campaign advertising and other direct expenses. And all of the advertising directs people to the Let's Make a Plan website where they can find a CFP professional to work with. The site features the Find Your CFP Professional search tool and resources about why people should work with a CFP professional. The site's current format has been in place for at least the last several years, so it was time to take a refreshing look at it. We're approaching the website refresh as we do with most projects at CFP Board, basing it on research. We've conducted both qualitative and quantitative studies with members of the site's target audience of consumers, and we also surveyed CFP professionals. The results of that research are informing the updates that we're making. We're updating the look and feel and updating the content across the entire site. Our website development partner is helping ensure that all of the updates are optimized for search engines. And much of the site's traffic is generated by our public awareness campaign. So again, we also get significant traffic from Google and Bing. The project is on target to launch before the end of the year. And as part of that redesign, we're also updating the site's listing of CFP professionals, including improvements on how we present information about the listing of CFP professionals. We're looking at improvements to the search options and criteria as well. One of the things that we're looking at is how to best present information through the search tool and listings about how customers pay for the services of a CFP professional. As some of you may remember, we removed the compensation filter information from the search tool early this year. And we won't be putting that compensation back exactly as it was previously as it did not provide especially helpful information and only 7% of the searches that are conducted each year actually filtered on the method of advisor compensation. Any updates we make will be made based on the research and testing with the website's target consumer audience. We look forward to sharing the new site with you later this year and uh, we're, we're getting very close. So uh, now let's get to the fun part, uh, the Q&A. A number of you uh, have noticed there's a Q&A function, and I'm seeing questions come in even as we speak. We'll kick right off into those questions uh, at this time. So first question, Jack, for you, Christina asks, <coughs> Would it be possible for a CFP certificate to be a robot? And how does the board feel about the current and future of robo advice? And I want to, one more question uh, that I'd like to uh, add. There was one more here. Uh, please opine, Dan writes, on FinTech in general as a complement and as a competitor for CFP professionals. So Jack, I'll turn that over to you. Thank you uh, to both Christina and Dan for your question. We certainly understand um, why this is a top of mind um, issue for all of us in this space. Um, to, to start out, to be clear, we do not foresee a day when the CFP certification program would be available to robots. But uh, the tools that robo advice platforms provide can be a great help to CFP professionals. And you know, it's important to point out this integration of technology is also um, 
broadening access to consumers who are seeking financial planning with new models, perhaps different levels of affordability. So that's a real positive. We are seeing more of the legacy or traditional firms and business models embrace these tools and technologies and the efficiencies they can provide for their clients. And interestingly, at the same time, some of the firms leading robo-advice platforms are tending to introduce more options for accessing human advice. So clearly you're seeing this hybrid model uh, develop in a much bigger way in the financial planning area. Um, human advice is not going away anytime soon. Human financial planners add a ton of value to their clients and really can't be replicated through robo advice or other technology. One of the examples we like to cite is, um, you might be interested to know, one of our fastest growing segments among CFP professionals is the uh, so-called call center advisor. From time to time, people question whether they do real financial planning, but in fact, they are providing quality advice human delivered but digitally enabled and as we talk about better defining career paths and on ramps to the profession these call center operations actually play an important role by making real financial advice delivery positions accessible for professionals who might be new to the financial advice profession I'll up there. Jack, thank you for that. Uh, Doug, I think this next question might be for you. Um, Greg asks, why do banks not allow us to use the CFP designation in email signatures and on business cards? Sure, I'd be happy to take that one, uh, Kevin. Uh, Greg, thanks for that question. Um, uh, let's see, I think I would say that most banks and a lot of the non-bank financial services firms, uh, they become more vigilant, I would say, in the way that they allow their employee titles to, to suggest what types of services uh, their employees offer. And I think um, just even a few years ago, it seems like everyone was holding themselves out as a financial planner. And I think we're finding that banks and firms are being more strict and probably more accurate when it comes to which employees are allowed to use that term. And so while I don't think we can speak to why individual banks might not allow their CFP professionals, uh, employees to put those marks on their business cards and their emails, it does seem likely uh, that, that their decision is gonna continue to follow that trend. Doug, you know, I think I would add to that, uh, Joe Majeri, CFP, is uh, part of our team, and he's responsible for firm relations, doing outreach to firms, working with firms about uh, encouraging them to use CFP certification, and candidly uh, encouraging them to institutionalize it, uh, and I'm talking about firms large and small. So one of the things that we're hearing, anecdotally but interestingly, is that firms are, some firms uh, are moving from where in the past they've had a designation policy to a point where now firms are more uh, likely to have a designation strategy. And so I think this is a positive uh, move and uh, we'll continue to work uh, with those firms who are committed to upholding CFP standards and, and implementing and institutionalizing CFP certification within their advisor programs. Jack, uh, next question for you. Jennifer asks, why don't we require all CFP professionals to act as fiduciary at, and then she capitalizes this, at all times, under all, again in cap, circumstances, eliminating the conflict of interest that could exist. Jack? Thanks for the question. That's actually a gap that CFP board has been able to close over the recent years by updating our standards and moving from 
acting as a fiduciary when providing financial planning to, you know, under the new code and standards, all CFP professionals are required to act as fiduciaries at all times when providing financial advice to a client, whether that advice involves product sales or not. You know, it's it's important to note in this in this discussion that product sales aren't the only element of financial advice that may involve conflicts of interest. Fiduciary experts would say all compensation models have the potential for some conflicts. There's clearly some examples in the very popular AUM model. And all CFP professionals are required to avoid or to mitigate and manage conflicts of interest. So while not all conflicts of interest are necessarily avoidable, a CFP professional must in fact act as a fiduciary at all times when providing financial advice to a client. And the obligation to act in the client's best interest remains even when conflicts are present. Thanks. Jack, you know, I would, I, I would add on that point, uh, in the past, uh, from like 2009 forward, our fiduciary duty only allow uh, only applied uh, when you were providing financial planning services or what we said were material elements of the financial planning process and so there were there was a gap there and i'm i'm really pleased that the board uh closed that gap we define financial advice very broadly um Paul has a question that's about volunteering at CFP Board. I think I'll take that. Uh, Paul asks, when will you be accepting volunteers to work on the job analysis or, or other projects? Well, Paul, the, the uh, job analysis is done, but I will tell you that volunteers play such an important role at CFP Board. There is no way that we could do the job without literally over a thousand individuals who volunteered their time away from their practice and away from their family in order to support CFP certification and the work of CFP board. So what I would tell you is there, we're always accepting volunteers and the uh, website address is www.cfp.net slash volunteer, I believe. I'm doing that from memory, Paul, but I think I've got that right. Um, Jack, a question for you. Michael writes, when will CFP board make uh, financial planning a real profession uh, that Michael writes? To do so, you know, why are we not like medicine or the bar association? And then in a related question, um, Michael asks, and must be another Michael, uh, I guess it's a similar question. He's, he's sent it in twice. He sent it in ahead of time and sent it in now. So uh, I will um, uh, turn that one to you, Jack. When will financial planning be a real profession? Michael, thanks for the question. It's probably um, among my most favorite topics in the work that we've been doing at the, at the board level with CFP board, we've been spending quite a bit of time on this. And in fact, we're very aligned with you, Michael. This is what CFP board has and will continue to pursue. If you think back earlier to this presentation, Doug King covered what we believe are the 17 elements of a profession. And we did, in fact, um, look closely at professions like accounting and law and medicine and the like, um, because we're we're really determined to you know under not only understand those elements of what constitutes a profession, but really have clarity on where we stand relative to where we're trying to get, and of course, most important, how can we best get there? So CFP board has um, a very important role to play in that ongoing work to establish financial planning as a recognized profession. But to be clear, it's not something that we can do alone. As, as we shared today, um, and as I just mentioned, we have begun the process of refreshing um, the strategic priorities for CFP board. 
And we've taken that occasion to convene leaders from across the profession to discuss and attempt to build consensus around what needs to be done to achieve an established financial planning profession. As, as you mentioned, Michael, the legal and medical professions are very important reference points. Uh, the accounting profession is another important reference point, especially given the status of the CPA license, a status which, in fact, we would love to see the CFP certification achieve. So um, rest assured, we're, we're working hard to continue driving uh, the, the, the direction of financial planning towards becoming a recognized and regulated profession. That's at the core of what we do. Um, but we certainly um, look to and need to work with many other partners across the financial advice ecosystem. Um, and that work will continue. Jack, thank you very much. Doug, a question for you. Paul writes, regarding the enforcement slash disciplinary language and tone from last year and earlier this year, Please explain why CFP Board feels compelled to function as an additional enforcement source for the industry when FINRA is already functioning in that source. Doug, you may be on mute. The old okay, yeah, I was. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. I was just going on. <laughs> so sure, I'll take that one, Kevin. Uh, first of all, Paul, I, I, I think we all want to thank you for that question because this really does give us an opportunity to stress that we do not feel it is our responsibility to become an enforcement source for the industry. And to that point, we have no authority over anyone in the industry other than those who are CFP professionals. And so um, we do, however, feel that anyone who uses the CFP marks should be held accountable to our own standards. And given that our mission of the CFP board is to benefit the public by granting the CFP certification and upholding it as a recognized standard of excellence for competent and ethical personal financial planning, I just read that off uh, the website, um, we feel that the only way to complete this mission is to uphold and enforce our own standards. And, I, and I'm sure you and all CFP professionals expect that of us, and we appreciate uh, help your your help in making sure the CFP marks continue to be the gold standard for providing ethical, competent financial planning. Doug, thank you very much. Uh, a question came in from Joseph. He asks, why is CFP Board not actively supporting the new DOL rule regarding prioritizing fiduciary responsibilities over ESG-linked investments? And I'll take that one. Uh, Joseph, um, you know, this summer the DOL proposed a rule limiting environmental, social, and governance investing in ERISA-governed retirement plans. The foundation of the proposed rule was that ESG considerations are not in keeping with a fiduciary obligation. The rule was met with uh, overwhelming opposition from retirement plan sponsors other financial firms, investor organizations, and others. In fact, one study said that 95% of the comment letters submitted to the DOL opposed the proposed rulemaking. Now, the final rule was released last Friday. It walked back, in some ways, the proposal. You know, although CFP Board and our partners in the Financial Planning Coalition typically get involved in fiduciary-related proposed rules, we do so on issues involving a fiduciary obligation generally for investment advice and not for specific issues. We didn't get involved in the rulemaking because of its specific focus on ESG, uh, and similarly, we didn't get involved when the DOL rulemaking this year said it was permissible for retirement plans to invest in private equity. So that's the story there. Doug, coming to you for the next question. Joel asks, now that we have uh, families more engaged in virtual environments, how has CFP Board leveraged this to provide consumer education? More ads on social media platforms, how can CFP certificates help? 
Okay, sure. Thank you uh, for that question, Joelle. Um, so our, pub our 2020 public awareness campaign advertising was launched in April, which all of you know was shortly after the pandemic was known, the severity of that, and during a time when our stay-at-home orders were in effect. And so we were able to take a look at the media landscape in the early stages of COVID-19, and we adapted our, our media strategy accordingly. And so what that means is, is during crisis events, media consumption ramps up, and research showed that television and online media consumption were at record highs. And so many advertisers, they took a pause from advertising this spring, which gave smaller campaigns like ours less cluttered space. And so we gave TV advertising a heavier than usual percentage of our strategy during that time using two 15-second ads that we believe were empathetic, relevant, helpful, appropriate for the times. And then most of the other campaign advertising this year was digital. And with a variety of digital and social media advertising as well as research, uh, search engine marketing. And so digital communication is a central to the work of our CFP board ambassadors. Uh, those folks work hard uh, around the country to share information about the importance of financial planning within their local media. And our team of ambassadors also creates blog posts uh, to the letsmakeaplan.org consumer website, which are advertised through the CFP board's social media channels and amplified through our ambassadors' uh, team's personal social media uh, accounts. And so if you're not already following the CFP board social media channels, uh, we encourage you to do so and to share out those messages from our public awareness campaign and ambassador blog posts that will be of interest to you and your prospective clients. Doug, thank you uh, very much for, for that. Doug, I'm going to stay with you here. We have a couple questions on pro bono. Uh, Megan asks, is there any discussion of requiring pro bono hours? And Timothy asks, I'm interested in understanding the pro bono work. He says he'd love to help a couple of households a year, but he doesn't want to sign up someplace and then have 10 people expecting him to help. So uh, I'm going to turn pro bono to you. Uh, we're coming up on the last couple of questions, so we'll need to be tight so we can finish on time. Sure, I'll take that one as well. Uh, so thank you both for that question. Um, so the answer to the first one is no. Uh, we are not contemplating a requirement for pro bono work. We would like to try to encourage folks to uh, consider that. Um, if as one of you asked the question earlier about you know, making financial planning a profession. And I think one of the things that, that we kind of get a knock on is that it's only for wealthy people. And so in order for us to really be considered, uh, you know, as someone that, that's for all people, uh, we think that that's working, uh, doing some pro bono work. We, we understand that it's a financial, you know, risk for you to get out there and consider potentially helping, you know, anybody that walks in the door because your time is very valuable. Um, but we have set up some ways that you can go about doing this. And so what we encourage you to do is visit the financial, uh, the Foundation for Financial Planning's website. You can learn about uh, the pro bono programs that we're, we're, we're looking at there. And then earlier this year, the Foundation released a new platform to connect CFP professionals with pre-screened nonprofits that have virtual and community-based opportunities to help those in need. And so there's a website, it's called probonoplannermatch.org. Again, that's probonoplannermatch.org. And this is where CFP professionals can create an account that on that platform, they can browse the listings of nonprofits and their, and, and their opportunities. They can connect with nonprofits that you might be interested in learning more about. And then you can volunteer if an opportunity is a good fit for you. So pro bono work is uh, likely very different than the other work you might do as a CFP professional. So the platform provides online training and delivering uh, on delivering pro bono services. And there's also a standard volunteer agreement that sets parameters for pro bono services. Uh, so there's no going to be no confusion there relative to what other services you might offer. And so once again, that's, uh, that website is probonoplannermatch.org. So we, we'll check it out. Thanks, Good. Guys. Thank you very much, Doug. Uh, this is going to be our last question. Jack, I'm coming to you. It's a question about uh, Reg BI. Michael writes, I'm interested in which, if any, actions CFP Board is taking with regards to the implementation 
of Reg BI. I have read that after a recent lawsuit against the SEC was dismissed, there's been a renewed focus at the state level. Would you speak to that, Michael asks? Yes, I would um, appreciate this opportunity, Michael. Thanks. So as you, as you may know, CFP board felt that the proposed Reg BI did not go far enough and needed clarity and more consumer protections. The SEC made some modifications before the final rulemaking was adopted, but it still left much to be desired. Um, with regard to its implementation, we're, we're, we've been watching, we continue to watch as the SEC releases guidance to advisors, and we're keeping an eye on how that impacts our CFP professionals. As recently as this June, um, we released a document comparing our code and standards to Reg BI, which I encourage you all to look at. That document provides guidance to those CFP professionals who are subject to Reg BI uh, to help them better understand CFP board's perspective on some important similarities and differences between CFP board's code and standards and the SEC's Reg BI. As you noted, Michael, during recent years, we've, we have in fact seen more state level activity related to fiduciary and, and other regulation. Unfortunately, however, the proposed regulations can be quite different from one state to the next, as many of us know. So, you know, it, we believe it would be preferable if we had a uniform national regulation rather than a piecemeal approach at the state level. So CFP board is not encouraging these, these state level initiatives. Jack, thank you for that. Uh, we're just about out of the time as we come to the top of the hour. Jack, this is your last certificate connection as chair of the board. What would you have to share with us? Uh, first and foremost, Kevin, I'd like to thank the CFP professional community for the, the terrific and important work it does for its clients day in and day out and for its support of CFP board and the CFP certification and frankly the advancement of the financial planning profession. Um, we are obviously living in unprecedented times. Uh, 2020 has been a critical year, however, for CFP board and the CFP certification, one that from a board perspective we're, we're, we're proud of. We feel that we've, we're making very important progress. We, for example, we began the actual enforcement of our new code and standards in the year 2020. We continued our work to further modernize and strengthen our enforcement capabilities, our, our governance structure at CFP board, and things like enterprise risk management. And as Doug alluded to earlier, we have moved forward with a, um, with it, what I'll call a very inclusive process and a very transparent process for updating the strategic priorities for CFP board. So it was a very um, satisfying year in terms of um, the work that the board does. It was a highly satisfying and fulfilling experience on my part serving on this board for four years and as its chair this year. And I owe Kevin and his executive team uh, not only great thanks for the for the support of the board, but for the great work that they do day in and day out. I, I truly believe CFP certificates like myself are in good hands based on what I've observed and witnessed firsthand at the CFP board and with the good people who are on the staff or are part of the significant volunteer community that Kevin spoke to. So thank you again. Um, I should have mentioned, too, that we're also making progress to advance diversity and inclusion in the profession, and that's something that I really encourage you to, to join our work. There's, there's several ways you can get involved, both at an individual level and as leaders within the firms and organizations that you're part of. I talked about the 2020 Diversity Summit going virtual. 
Um, please look at that. You'll be able to join us from anywhere in the world. And I assure you the event will spark good connections, conversations, and most importantly, implementable strategies and actions. So please plan to join us on November 18th through the 20th for this important meeting, which again will focus on actionable initiatives to advance diversity in our profession. Doug? Thank you for that, Jack. And if, yes, thank you, Jack. And if I uh, may, I also want to thank the CFP professional community and everyone who supports it. Um, all of us at the CFP board appreciate everyone who's taken the time to share feedback as part of the strategy refresh process. We look forward to finalizing a new set of strategic priorities for the CFP board next year. And we want to recognize the tremendous work you're all doing to address your clients' needs during this very stressful time. And as as you know, the CFP board achieves its mission to benefit the public, and they do that through the work of CFP professionals. And the clients of the CFP professionals are very fortunate to have all of you on their side. And we recognize that you are also dealing with your own concerns and stress, so please remember to take care of yourself. And finally, yeah. I want to thank you, Jack, for your leadership. Uh, Jack, on the board over the last four years as our chair, and as our chair in 2020, uh, you covered a lot of ground this year, and you're going to have some uh, pretty big shoes to follow uh, to fill there for, for next year. So thank you. Yeah, gentlemen, thank you both. That comment about taking care of yourself indeed is so important. I appreciate your leadership, both of you, Jack and Doug, and thank everyone on the board for their dedication and support to CFP Board's mission. In closing, thank you all for joining us today. We ran over just a couple of minutes. This recording uh, will be posted on CFP Board's website within the next few business days, and CFP Board will follow up individually with those of you who ask questions that we did not get to during this broadcast. On behalf of Jack and Doug, I'm Kevin Keller. Have a good day, everybody.